When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett. And I'm Brian Colbert Kennedy. And this is the podcast where we give you the tools you need to fight for a better future for everyone. Uh, The context, straight from the smartest people on earth, the people out there on the front lines. uh, And we give you the action steps you can take to support them. That's right. And our guests have been scientists, doctors, nurses, journalists, Uh, engineers and farmers, politicians, activists, educators, business leaders, astronauts. We had a reverend. I think we've had everyone. We have. We've had, uh, importantly as well, you know, mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and sons and daughters and everyone in between uh, and outside the box. And um, it is those relationships and those people that that seem to be moving the needle uh, the most these days. Uh, and that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, this okay. is your friendly reminder. You can send questions, thoughts, and feedback to us uh, on Twitter at importantnotimp, or you can email us at funtalk at importantnotimportant.com. And you can join tens of thousands of other smart people and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. That's right. Uh, Brian, this week's episode is going to give you, uh, listeners, Uh, The context and tools you need to help stop school shootings in America. Sounds amazing and necessary. It it is. And and yeah, our guest is is Fred Guttenberg. Uh, Fred is a man that has been through so much in the past few years, has decided to use the remainder of his life to fight for common sense gun control and uh, to inspire others to make the great change that's uh, so possible and so needed uh, in America today. And just a quick technical note, you'll hear Brian at the beginning of this conversation, and then that's it. Thanks to California falling into the ocean, Brian's internet yep. turned off oh, 10 minutes in, maybe. Yeah, maybe. And we never got him back. So he's going to hear this for the first time, just like you. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, let's uh, let's go talk to Fred. Let's Let's hear his story. Our guest today is Fred Gutenberg, and together we're going to find out how you can help stop school shootings in America. Uh, Fred, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. We are very, very happy to have you uh, on today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Let's get uh, started by uh, just telling everybody, Fred, um, just a real quick who you are and and what you do. I am, I guess, what they would call a gun safety activist, um, a political troublemaker. Um, yes. My life as those things began February 14th, 2018, when my daughter Jamie and my son Jesse went to school and only one of them came home. They both were there for the school shooting in Parkland, Florida. Um, thank God my son Jesse wasn't killed, but he did unfortunately hear the bullets that were killing his sister. And because of what happened to my family, I I live with a guilt that I never put my voice into this fight before when it was other people's kids. And anyone who knows me now knows I'm never going to shut up going forward um, because there are still too many kids, too many adults, too many Americans being shot and killed every day. So this is now my life. Well, th- th- thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you have our most s- sincere apologies that that you that you have have to share it. That you have to have 
had this experience and your families had to have this experience, especially your, your son. Uh, but we, we hope we, we can help you move the needle to, to make this stop happening. Thank you. Uh, Fred, again, a quick reminder, our goal is just to provide some, some good context for the, for this question at hand for this topic. And then we're going to dig into Mm -hmm. some, uh, some action oriented questions. We'll try not to go off the rails too much, but occasionally that happens and that's okay. Uh, and then we'll get into what everybody out there uh, can do about, uh, about what's going on. Fred, uh, I probably should have tinkered with this ahead of time. We usually start with one question that kind of sets the tone for things. And, and instead of saying, Tell us your life story. We like to ask, F- Fred, why why are you vital to the survival of the species? And uh, it can be a little silly, and and people often laugh, but we do encourage them to be bold and and honest. We get a lot of laughter, uh, and we get a lot of scoffing. But usually, from some scientist who's just figured out how to pull, f- you know, drinking water out of thin air or something like that. <laughs> Uh, it's something interesting, you know, what, why they're out there doing what they do. And obviously you're, you've just explained why you do what you do. So we can, we can skip past this one if you like, or if you, if you feel like there's something you've realized. No, listen, on. Um, I, I don't know that I would call myself a vital, <laughs> but I want to keep you from being shot. I want to keep those you love from being shot. I want to keep those you love who have friends and cousins and family and parents and sons and daughters from being shot and from ending up having a lifetime of consequences from getting shot or worse, ending up dead. And the reality is that's happening right now for 40,000 Americans a year are dying every year in this country and the number is getting worse. And there's more than than that number who get injured and live with permanent injuries every year because we have, as a country, done nothing about the issue of gun violence. Am I vital? I don't know. But if we do the things that I would like to do, fewer people are going to be shot and fewer people are going to be killed. Um, that's a that's a, a, a an obvious, if if incredibly admirable, and and uh, um, a, a goal that is inexcusable that we've addressed so far. But all we can do is 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 help you uh push forward help the movement push forward um so uh just some quick context for folks and and you just alluded to some of it um friends listeners you know we haven't talked too much uh about guns on this show we we you might be wondering how gun violence fits into our prism of the the science questions and issues that are affecting everyone right now well as as fred alluded to forty thousand americans are killed by guns each year. And that does not include uh, the the probably 10x number that are injured. Um, that's over 100 Americans killed every day from guns. And, and as you said, it's, it's, exactly it's on the right. increase. And uh, a, a large number of those are suicides. Tens of thousands are homicides, school shootings. And, and you can... Uh, you can help me here because it it looked as though through all my research that that a hard agreed upon number is difficult to pin down because there's no real nationally accepted definition. Uh, every town, uh, the group Every Town claims there have been 594 incidents of gunfire on school grounds since 2013, resulting in 216 correct. deaths and 425 injuries. Is that uh, around the correct number? No, listen, um, that is correct. The good news is for the past six months school shootings aren't happening so weird Um, but that's because we have a pandemic yeah so so it does you know uh you know that is the one beneficial side effect but unfortunately during this pandemic this administration unleashed a gun surge on this country Mm -hmm. and the level of gun buying especially in the early part of the pandemic went through the roof they made a big focus of treating gun stores as essential businesses, not non-essential. And with the fear and panic that people had early on about economic insecurity and other things, a lot of people ran and bought guns. A lot of new first-time gun owners, a lot of people who were gun owners who bought more guns, they loaded up on ammunition. And we've already seen around the country the increases in gun violence as a result People who are first-time buyers or even who weren't first-time buyers, they don't lock their weapons up, so children end up taking guns. And as we reopen schools, I 
fear, we're going to see the consequences of this as well sure. with an increase in gun violence at school. It's it's unfortunate that it seems like one plus one equals two a little bit in this situation um, because we do have a, a well trod path of this. Um, it, I I think it's again important to note, and this is something we we have dug into before, and and I think it uh, seems to affect in some way both sides of this things that you know we are a a a by design in some ways a, a troubled country. Um, m- mental health, which we've talked about before. Uh, and we're going to continue to talk about is on the decline uh, in our country and around the world, certainly because of COVID and uh, because of inequality and climate change and psychiatric disorders and substance abuse and genetics and toxic environments, brain imbalances. Uh, You know, the point is that's the underlying layer, but we are not only troubled, we have for uh, since the second amendment, whatever that is, 229, 230 years allowed our citizens to arm themselves and to sell arms among themselves, uh, with, with only a, a, a potpourri of very light regulations. Uh, and, and this enables those 40,000 Americans, uh, to be killed each year. And that includes 216 students and, and teachers killed in their classrooms in, in just the past seven years. And, and, and the names everyone recognizes and remembers, Virginia Tech and Sandy Hook mm-hmm. and Columbine and Santa Fe and Umpqua and Parkland. And the second order effects of these killings and of so many, so many wounded, um, many of them just children, is devastating grief and mourning, but also purpose-driven action. And, and this fight for a better future a safer future is more prevalent uh, than it's ever been. And that's listeners where you come in and and where today's guests come in. So uh, that is our goal today to understand how you can help stop these school shootings in America because they don't really <laughs> happen a lot of other places. Fred and, and um, I want to be clear that we can, if you're, if you're not comfortable with this, we can, we can skip this part, but statistics haven't moved the needle for people lately whether any of these science, all of California and Oregon is on fire right now and, and statistics aren't moving the needle and sea level rise and, and, and things like that. So, so stories are, are what matter. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit about uh, your daughter, Jamie. Well, I, I, I would love to, uh, but I want to say something about statistics. Uh, they ha- the, actually, the needle has moved. The majority of Americans do support gun safety. In fact, over 90%. Um, the majority of gun owners are saying they support gun safety. The House of Representatives in the last election flipped primarily on this mm-hmm. issue. The only person in Florida who ran a statewide campaign on gun safety, um, Nikki Freed, who ran for Commissioner of Agriculture and Business Services, mm-hmm. she won in mm-hmm. Florida. So, so the needle is moving. The, the issue is there's a well-funded, mm-hmm. although they're not, not as well-funded well anymore, used to be. <laughs> gun lobby that manages to hold a certain party and their legislators hostage. And that has prevented legislation at a national sure. level. But we see things happening through states and cities across the country. So, so you know, I, I don't want people to think nothing is happening because the needle is moving. It's slow and it's steady, but it's moving. But the person with the biggest ability to do something at all, the biggest bully sure. pulpit, the current occupant of the White House, unfortunately, um, he's on the hotline with the NRA. Sure. So so we need to fire him. And we need to flip the Senate and get rid of McConnell, who refuses to do anything. And we're going to on November Absolutely. 3rd. Uh, my, my daughter... Um, Listen, she was my everything. <clears throat> my children are. Anyone who knew me before February 14th will tell you that um, other than my work, my life revolved around my kids. Hockey with my son, mm-hmm. dance with my daughter, camping, because I did a lot of camping with the mm-hmm. kids, um, schoolwork, just sitting down and watching television, but I'm always with them. We were not the types of parents that ever took a vacation without our kids, everything was with them. And my daughter, she was everything to me. Um, She was a beautiful, fierce 14-year-old kid 
who fought for others. My daughter hated bullies, and she would inject herself um, if she saw a bully bullying somebody at school. You know, she was pretty petite, and I always got worried about her safety, but you know, she was a really tough-minded kid, and I wasn't going to stop her from sure. doing it. She dedicated her time to kids with special needs. Um, you know, she wanted to be a pediatric physical therapist when she grew up. She even knew where she wanted to work, a place in Palm Beach that does surgeries on kids with limb deformities. And it was her dream to help a kid walk for the first time who couldn't because of different physical issues. My daughter believed everybody who she came in contact with was just like her, had the same rights to um all the opportunities that she had, and she treated everyone that way. Um, the world lost a really special soul. Um, she was definitely the toughest person I knew. Um, and um, she stands on my shoulders every day, pushing me forward. Well, thank you for sharing that. I had, I had, I had, done some reading um and and uh i saw that she was a dancer and loved to dance and i thought my my um my grandmother was a rockette back in the day um so oh. while, while i am i uh did not get those genes and i'm objectively terrible i have uh, a a huge appreciation um for the work and the passion that goes into it especially starting so young and looking forward to a you know a lifetime of being able to use that and and learn from it in, in so many different ways. And I I love that she wanted to go into physical therapy. Is there something specific that that was a catalyst for that? Well, um, she's a mini me to my wife, and my wife is a pediatric occupational therapist working with children with special okay. needs. So um that that definitely played a role. Uh, that makes sense. Um well there there's nothing quite like a a 14 year old who already knows that they want to help people. That is something, uh, something very special. Um, okay. Fred, could you give us a, a brief clarification of exactly what changes in laws you are fighting for? Cause from everything I understand, you've taken a very, uh, pragmatic, uh, uh, policy approach, uh, to, to where we can yeah. hopefully go forward. If you can just kind of give us the bullet list of that, and then we can uh, use that as the tone for everything. Well, my, my first goal is what I said the day after my daughter was killed. And it really kind of settled in me that I was a victim of gun violence and I want to break the fucking gun lobby. Um, that has been my goal. Number one, because they interfere with doing things that, can keep us from being the next victim of gun violence. And I think we're succeeding in that um, in ways big and small. And when we get them out of the decisions about our safety, uh, here's what I do want to do. Um, because this isn't a Second Amendment argument. That bullshit is mm -hmm. over. And we, and, and we see the end to that BS now because all those Second Amendment defenders who said it was to protect from a overzealous government, they're now out on the streets with their sure. weapons, uh, shooting people in order to defend this particular president. So, so they're now part of that overzealous government. Um, so the BS on that is over. And this is about our safety, not about the rights to legal lawful gun owners, but about our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So where do we start? Number one, Background checks. The, the bill has already passed the House. Get it through the Senate, and Joe Biden will sign it. But it shouldn't just be on weapons. It should be extended to ammunition. Um, I've been working to pass Jamie's law, which will extend background checks to ammunition. And the reason why I believe so strongly in that, we already have 400 million weapons on the streets of this country right now. Many of them in the hands of gun owners who are prohibited purchasers or maybe um, will end up in the hands of gun owners who are prohibited purchasers. In this country, by law, if you're a prohibited purchaser of a firearm, you're also prohibited from buying ammunition, but there's no requirement for a background check on ammunition. So prohibited purchasers or prohibited 
buyers of weapons who happen to be in possession of them anyway can just walk into any old store and buy the bullets. And so we need to shut down that loophole. So background checks on firearms and on ammunition. That's number one. I believe strongly if you want to solve this problem in a long-term sustainable way, repeal a federal law known as PLACA, which shields this industry from lawsuits. Mm. The greatest, most sustainable way to fix any problem is to put people's uh, ability to shield themselves from liability on the line. It'll get, you know, there's an expense to that, but there's also potential criminal activity when you can start showing they lied or they didn't follow the law the way they marketed their weapons. And listen, uh, you know, I've got a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission now on the way Smith & Wesson marketed weapons to the daughter, to the killer of my daughter. You know, if we want lasting change, make that industry responsible for what they do, kind of the way it happened with tobacco, and it'll never be the same. I think we need to ban high-capacity magazines. I um, also believe we need to ban um, assault weapons. Now, I was slow to get there. I, for the first year and a half, two years, was not calling for that. I, I And partly because if you call for a ban on assault weapons, it tends to, um, with the other side, shut down conversation on other reasonable things. But then the other side started doing something. They started showing up at peaceful moments with those assault weapons strapped around their shoulder. And they started using those assault weapons as a form of armed intimidation. That changed everything for me. Because we now know not only will they show up as a form of armed intimidation, they will use those right. weapons. And those weapons are destructive. Um, there's There are many articles that have been written about the effect of those bullets mm. on our bodies um, and how they just simply rip them to they're shreds. designed to do that. So we need to... I said they're, they're, they're inherently designed to do that. Yes. Yes. So, so we need to ban those assault weapons. Uh, we need to raise the purchase age of firearms to 21. The reality is kids, especially young boys, and I've got a soon-to-be 20-year-old teenager um, who I love with every ounce of my being, and I love all of his friends, but truth is, they're a bunch of knuckleheads still. Uh, they're boys. I mean, we're idiots. Yeah. And so, you know, and they're, they can still be impulsive and emotional. And so sure. we need to change the age 21. Um, we need to allow the federal government to study gun violence and fund that. So mm-hmm. we need to fund the CDC and, and, and give them the ability and the money to say, we're going to study this to see, is this a true public health crisis? Because, listen, we all know it is, but by not studying it, they can't, don't have to validate it. And we need to say no more of that. Too many people are dying. It's time for you to study this as the public health crisis that it is and make recommendations because of that. Um, so there's a whole host of just pragmatic, reasonable things that can be done. I haven't even gone close to all of the other things, you know, and other loopholes that should be closed and things sure. like track and trace and ghost guns, uh, sure. you know, which we all, um, you know, I think, and again, you guys are into the research side of things, so you probably know what ghost guns are, but um, there's, there's, you know, you could go and buy, um, components in different locations, 80% in one location, 20% mm-hmm. in the other, mm-hmm. you take it home, you put it together, you have a gun without a serial number that works. And then you can walk in as a prohibited purchaser to any old store and buy the bullets. Um, we need to Unreal. shut down that ghost gun pipeline. Um, we need to do something about 3d weapons, which to me, in the long run, are the scariest thing because people can just start making their guns at home. Uh, sure. So there's so much we need to do. And every day that we're not at a national level dealing with these things is a threat to your life. Well, thank you for summing that up. It it, it seems, you know, uh, so obvious and again, so pragmatic. 
Um, and like you said, doesn't include the 300 uh, loopholes that 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 also should be closed. But but these seem like as as uh, has been put the, the common sense moves. Now those uh, uh, for the most part um, haven't been completed because there's obviously folks in America who who have no interest uh, to put it lightly in in enacting any of those things. Um, and they're, and they're mostly as you pointed out the 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 big money that is behind the gun lobby and and the the fringe mostly white people marching in the streets with AR15s uh playing military dress up and it turns out um who are who are willing to use those uh guns and and again they they have this fairly predictable list of reasons uh that they drag out like you said the second amendment which is which is bullshit um they'll say things like um the, the, their guns are for hunting or for self defense uh or of course that guns don't kill people that that people kill people um, and so ignoring for a moment again all of the data that shows that the frequency of school shootings in the U.S. is, is so much higher than, than, than many other countries combined. And, and again, to be clear, those are countries uh, that have people, too, um, people who, who want to and do hurt other people and, and people with psychiatric disorders and, and bullied people, whatever. They have the same cross-section of life that we do, but they don't have what, the, that what we have. They don't have 14-year-olds and kindergartners who are shot to death. Um, so, Fred, I, I am always eager on, on this show and, and 10 times the number of conversations offline to find common ground where I can, um, but, but it, it is difficult to find it with some of these uh, folks, no matter how you, like you said, so many Americans are now for gun control, but the people who are pulling the strings, uh, I do wonder if there are any lessons you've learned in the past two years about how, how again, pragmatically to talk to these folks who are funding the efforts against these new common sense gun control laws. Like where have you been able to find purchase with these folks, if at all? Well, well I guess it depends on who these folks are. So if yeah. you're talking about the typical gun owner in this country, most of them are so reasonable and pragmatic. And when I talk about what I want to do, they're all in and they agree. If you're talking about a small subset, which make up the leadership of these organizations and and, and a few of the really radicalized gun owners, mm -hmm. you're not going to talk to them. Um, you know, they are, they are all in and we need to defeat them. Um, you know, if you're talking about, um, those who are forming the roadblock in Washington, DC, and I mean the mm -hmm. current occupant of the white house and McConnell and sure. others in the Senate, we need to fire them. We're not going to change them. November 3rd to me is everything. Um, I don't mean to be overly dramatic here. Um, it's impossible on this show, but. Don't worry. But this is not an election like other elections where you hold your nose and you say, ah, you know, they're all like this, they're all the same, maybe a little different. No, there's a stark, stark contrast here. If we real if we send the current guy and the current Senate back, um, I think we all can probably imagine what the effects on democracy would be, which are horrific. But you can also end the conversation on gun safety. It's not happening. Um, legislatively, sure. it won't. And judicially, we're going to end up with more Kavanaugh's. So right. it'll be over. It's, and and that, it is that dramatic. But, and I can say this with certainty because um, and I just wrote a book about it called Find the Help. Right. Um, right. I've gotten to know Joe Biden, one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. And he is so committed to fixing this problem and doing something about it. If, if we send him to Washington, D.C., and we flip the Senate, not only does gun safety get done, Republicans in the Senate will vote for it. You know, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the thing that people don't get. This, to me, is not a partisan issue. If a bullet hits you, it doesn't ask first, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Sure. And so it is a nonpartisan issue, but the response has been starkly partisan and it done so in a way where senators have not even had to state their opinion because Mitch McConnell won't even let it come up. 
So if, if we flip the Senate, if we bring on Joe Biden, you will see Republican senators join Democratic senators and vote for gun safety measures. We've seen it in the House. Republican sure. House and- members voted with Democratic House members to pass gun safety that is just waiting to go to the Senate right now. Sure. So, you know, there are governors who are Republicans and are doing stuff. Larry Hogan in Maryland, um, John Kasich mm-hmm. in Ohio tried. He brought me to testify sure. on gun safety issues. So there are Republicans who believe as deeply about this as I do, but we've got to help them succeed. And that involves firing several people sure. that need to go. And and I you know I, I love that our audience besides the elected officials can, can be fairly young, but I, I want to be clear for those listeners and who might not be aware that the the types of weapon that was used to murder your daughter and and so many others and the style of weapon that was used to murder twenty young children in Newtown uh, was once banned, if briefly, in this country. Uh, it was assault weapons. We're banned for for a decade, but it's but it's of course uh, it's complicated. So this was uh, I think it was 1994 to about 2004. That's correct. Um, it ex- it expired. It was never renewed. Of course, it was challenged in court, and 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 those people lost. Um, now, I mean, f- from everything I gathered, research into the ban showed that it was only moderately uh, effective. I think gun crimes involving assault weapons went down a little bit. Crimes with other guns went up, but but this was the key issue was the law didn't actually ban those guns. It banned any new manufacturing of those guns. Correct. And so the numbers that were out there. Correct. Yeah. The the numbers I, I, I I was able to, to verify as far as I could were that, uh, the, the, there were 1.5 million assault weapons and 25 to 50 million large capacity magazines that were grandfathered in to this 10 year law. Um, so clearly, um, Great that it existed at one point, but as always, uh, the, the devil is truly in the details there. And if you've still got 1.5 million AR-15s and and the like on the market uh, and able to be sold uh, individually with no background checks from person to person, then it just doesn't fucking matter. Fred, you've talked so much about how 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 the people in power and the people with the money are the ones uh, we need to be replaced, and at the same time, the ones who are going to make a difference. And and we do try to look locally as well uh, when we're talking about these kind of issues, because often that's where people can have the most impact. And so I want to talk for a minute about what what happened in in Parkland and and most importantly, what happened before Parkland, before your daughter was murdered. Um, So from everything, please, again, correct me anywhere I'm, I'm wrong here, but there had been a number of prior red flags about this person. Correct. Tips called into the sheriff's office. YouTube videos, Snapchat videos, calls to the FBI, documented behavioral issues. He'd made threats against other students, been kicked out of your daughter's school twice, I believe, uh, was in Instagram groups where he talked about keeping black people in chains, swastikas carved into guns. Uh, The sheriff's log showed 45 calls made about Cruz or his family in the prior 10 years, but he was still able to legally buy a firearm. Um, and And in some other country, that's that's obviously... Uh, not going to be the case. But this was someone who'd proven over and again that he had publicly made intentions to use violence on others that others had called in on. And yet in Florida, in America, he was able to legally buy this assault weapon. So now I want to take a step back because that's what happened in in in, in your city in Florida. Uh, and you've talked about, again, about holding the manufacturers and the marketers of these weapons and uh, liable what are the failures in what were the failures in Parkland prior and during and after well, that are specific that specifically are transferable across other American towns and cities and states? Where did the system f- fail to prevent your daughter's murder? Well, for, uh, before I answer that, first things first. Yeah, the boy who n- murdered my daughter today would not be able to buy his weapons because following Parkland, we did raise the age twenty one and we passed red flag laws which would have triggered a different kind of action than what was previously available. And mm-hmm. in today's Florida um, environment, he would not be able to buy those weapons. But those laws didn't exist back then. Here's here's the deal about the failures. And by the way, failures, you know, after these shootings, 
we always get to go back and look at the failures and there are always going to be failures and things you can look at and say, um, this was a mess up. It wasn't the gun. It was the failures. Um, sure. But the reality is the access to these weapons ensures that these things will happen again. Um, listen, everyone failed. I'm suing all of them. The Broward Sheriff's mm-hmm. Office failed. The school district failed. The To me, the most significant failure happened 30 days before the shooting. Um, and that was with the FBI. They had direct, specific, actionable intelligence. And I have a very active lawsuit against them. And typically, you're not able to sue the FBI because of different immunities that they have. And they filed all these motions to dismiss. And we actually just prevailed on all their motions to dismiss. And this is going to trial. Um, so wow. it's a really, actually, it's a very big deal um, right now of a lawsuit. Um, because the FBI really relies on those immunities. Um, what happened is they have a call center that received a call 30 days before. And the person at the call center should have triggered this call up to further review by other law enforcement agencies. And the thing is, this person from the call center told the caller that, in fact, that was going to happen. So, and so there was actually a process that was supposed to be in place, is what you're that, saying? That was supposed to be in place, but it failed to happen. And had the protocols and processes been followed, this person would have been most likely apprehended and this thing would have been short-circuited. Uh, but it didn't. And the caller to the FBI call center was under the understanding that it was going to happen and so didn't reach out to other levels of law enforcement because it you know, was under the impression the FBI was on it. Um, mm-hmm. We all know the reality. They weren't. Um, and um, 17 people died. <sighs> right. And again, those were the processes that were already in place. And, and now you said that Florida did enact uh, a number of laws. Uh, they, they raised the the gun buying agent and a few other items. Um, and red were there flag other, and other items. And red flag. Were, were there other states that reacted similarly in, in that period? Or, oh, or yeah. Since? Listen, you can look at the states following Florida. Uh, you know, red flag laws started passing all over the country. Uh, mm-hmm. Other states have raised the age. Other states, you know, whether you look at California, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, Washington State, um, I mean, all over the country, implementing new gun safety laws, you know, to prevent certain things from happening again, you know, and these gun safety laws are working, are saving lives. Unfortunately, um, you know, the industry is just as aggressive at trying to force more guns on the street. Um, so mm-hmm. it's a never ending battle. And until we have federal legislation to deal with this, you're mm-hmm. always going to be looking at your safety is dependent upon um, the city next to you or the state next to you. You know, sure. because, uh, you know, guns can be driven across state lines, go across city lines. Um, and, sure. and that's why we must do this at a national level. And 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 uh, it's clearly not apples to oranges in, in really any way. But it's the same thing, you know. We talk, when we talk about air pollution or COVID, whatever it might be on the show, which is that um, state boundaries don't don't mean anything. No, uh, these these emissions are 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 and and viruses are are everywhere. And that's why, um, as much as we are a United States. Uh, and there's so many various arguments. We can have an entirely different episode about states' rights versus federal action, size of government. Um, in, in some places, it is vitally important that the federal government take overwhelming comprehensive action. Otherwise, it just doesn't fucking matter what each city and state is doing. Correct. Um, because your your flanks are still left completely exposed to, uh, like we have seen on the TV over the past six months, um, these white guys in military fatigues and helmets uh, and and their boots bought from Walmart showing up with these guns strapped across them, and we go, how can that be? And then they start using them, and and we go, it's because we've we've let them do that, and they're able to do that, and um, it is a fundamental 
design of this place and and has become a, a full on breakdown. And it's it's scary with with elected officials either like McConnell who might be one of the worst people in history uh, that that are that are sto- not just uh, negligent on these things, but stonewalling them entirely to 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 people like uh, Trump and and the others like him um, who are writing op eds and saying things in the news and on Twitter to to incite um, violence, which again would look different in any other country except for we allow ourselves to be armed and to trade these arms. Fred, uh, you've got your new book that came out. So this is our, our show is going to come out uh, on the, I believe, 20, 21st or 22nd here. So your book will have been out a week. Very exciting. Uh, I, the, the title of it, I could not love any more than I do as a, as a, uh, as a long time uh, fan, uh, find, find the helpers. But um, as far as I understand it, 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 it isn't really, uh, the book isn't really about gun legislation. Uh it's about your 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 journey, correct? Um, I, I believe, and I um, again in my research, I know that uh, losing your uh, daughter wasn't the start of your journey through grief. I know your your brother had just died a few months prior, four, four from, months prior from cancer related to nine eleven. Um, my brother ran the triage <sighs> for the World Trade Center, was in the Jeez. World Trade Center when it actually collapsed, and. Somehow or another, he and the team of people he were with, the room they hid out in, did not collapse. And they spent 16 days there treating people. He was a physician, but um, he eventually succumbed to cancer because of that exposure. And, um, you know, listen, my book, um, I do tell his story. I tell my daughter's story. I talk about what happened. But the main message of my book is about the amazing people who either were part of my life or became a part of my life because of both of those moments Mm -hmm. and how they carried me, um, how they helped me to go forward, how they helped me to be okay every single day. And and I hope um, that when people read my book, that no matter what they're going through, if nothing else, they immediately think, you know what? I need to figure who my helpers are and I need to do a better job of staying connected to my helpers and more, maybe as important, they figure out I'm actually doing okay. Now, who can I be a helper to? Uh, Because in spite of the way things maybe feel right now in this political climate and with the pandemic, we are all incredibly social people, connected people, and we need each other. My my book is not a book where um, I I talk about despair. Um, my book is a book where I hope people will read it and say, "I can be okay. I'm going to be okay." Yeah. I, and it, it's a book about hope and going forward. And it's also a a message to our younger people with life lessons on perspective and strength and resilience, and reminding them all. No matter what you're going through in life, you're going to be okay. You can get through it. And that sometimes in life's toughest moments, heroes and leaders are born. So that's the general gist of the book. Um, I tell the stories of all the amazing people and connections and how they happened. And um, and I hope people like it. Well, I... Obviously, again, you know, uh, you, you, none of us have a time machine, but a, a world where this book didn't have to exist would would be would be wonderful. But I, I imagine there will be so many people who who can take strength from it. In, in thinking about that, and, and I've I've thought about this a, a lot lately. I've always been drawn to uh, the writings of of Viktor Frankl. Many that have guided me, especially in this moment. And thinking about your book, I think of just a a, a few, which is. First is what you have experienced, no power on earth can take from you. And um, all we have suffered, all this is not lost, though it is past. We have brought it into being. Each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. And, you know, the purpose of these conversations that we have here, again, whether they're about cancer or the ocean or school shootings, are, are intended to help our audience act with purpose. Um, which is to say to make sure that they understand fully the context behind what's going on, um, to identify how they can relate to it, 
um, if they can, how it matches up with their own values. And then again, to take the most effective action to, to move the needle in whatever the subject might be. And, and obviously your, your daughter being murdered is going to push a father one way or the other into action or, or seclusion. And so I, I, I really, I appreciate you sharing how you found your purpose and, and, uh, making such a focus of it, paying it forward, uh, paying it back to the people who, who were in your life and the new ones in your life, and then paying it forward because we look at these, I mean, every, uh, every, I feel like every week I, I get sent news about the statistics about the young people. And right now because of COVID and being trapped at home and can't go to school and their future with climate change. And it's, you know, uh, they, they, they pull these children, uh, you know, up to age 21 and um you know in the past six months a quarter have considered suicide and you just go what what have what have we done and and how can we we fix this because you know these 65 year old white men who've been in office for for 30 years just don't give a shit because that's not their future it is it is the future for these young people the future unlike your daughter for these children who still have a future uh we have to we have to do better and and um Anyways, I, I'm I'm just thankful that you you have decided to frame it this way, and I, I hope that a lot of people benefit from it. Well, I appreciate that. So, thank you. So, uh, Fred, our our goal is to provide again specific action steps our listeners can t- t- take to support your mission. Uh, we like to say with their voice, their vote, and their dollar. Uh, so, I want to hone in on that. <laughs> clearly, we haven't talked at all here about November third. Th- th- this is the the day of reckoning. Clearly, do you have any? one of the things we like to talk about with their voice is like, what are the big actionable, but specific questions that that our audience should be asking of their current representatives and these people that are running for office um, specific to your story and your mission? Well, listen, uh, November 3rd is everything to me. And I, and I think people need to choose candidates who a, behave with decency and civility because the modeling of decency and civility alone will tamp down rhetoric and make us safer. I think people need to um, choose candidates who clearly have an easier time telling the truth. Um, And I think candidates need to know where I'm sorry, people need to know where candidates stand on the issue of guns and gun safety because failure on this issue in another election simply puts your life at risk. Um, and if your life is worth living to you and the those of who you love, if their lives are worth it to you, then this is an issue you need to vote on. Um, there's no exceptions to that. This is a issue that we can start solving but we have to vote for people who plan to support us in that mission and so this election is everything we we've we've got to fire the current occupant of the white house we've got to flip the senate and if we do those two things i think we're going to be on a path back to being okay and on a path back to addressing the concrete things we need to do to start making those we love safer Sounds good. Sounds pretty good to me. So, so, so obviously folks, if you're out there and, uh, register to vote, uh, and, and, uh, mail and ballots are starting to get sent everywhere. Can I say something about that? It, oh God, start please. now. Okay. Don't yeah. wait. This election is not like other elections. Have a plan executed yeah. early. No, if you're able to order your ballot now, get it now. If you're get it in the mail now. Put it in a drop box, okay? Um, yep. You know, no no games. If you're able to do early voting, do it. Do not wait till election. Do day. it now. Do not wait. Have a plan now. We're, we're under 60 days, where I think today is 55 or 56. So, mm-hmm. so it, it is time to figure out how you're going to vote and make your vote count. 
Absolutely. Um, th- there's a number of places that have sprung up out of out of necessity uh, to to help support your efforts. If you just go like, great, how do I find out if I'm registered? Um, uh, so many come to mind. The easiest one, uh, go to votesaveamerica.com. They have built some wonderful tools. That's the folks over at Pod Save America um, and Crooked Media. Uh, some wonderful tools to guide you. I mean, it couldn't be easier, like a kindergartner could do it, um, to figure out if you're registered, if not, to change your address, to get your ballot. Uh, and then from then on, once you're done, to find a way to volunteer uh, to support, uh, again, these Senate candidates, House candidates, uh, Joe Biden and uh, and Senator Harris. Um, there's there's so much you can do every one of these fucking days uh, for the next 55 days. Fred, what about what about their dollar? What can folks do? I know, obviously, uh, we'd love for them to go out and buy and read your book. Uh, do you want to talk about Orange Ribbons for Jamie at all? Um, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, r- real quick. Um Listen, that's the foundation that we started to honor the memory of my daughter. Um, and and we, we do things that would have been important to Jamie. So we've given money to um, this place called the Paley Institute, which is where Jamie wanted to work, to the Humane Society because Jamie was dog obsessed, to different mm-hmm. organizations that work with children with special needs. But um, the... To me, the most important thing we've done is a scholarship program that we've started for kids of all abilities. So we have three buckets to that. Um, One is for kids who want to go to school and major in something where you're going to be helping others. Maybe it's occupational therapy or physical therapy. You have to have a one-year background in dance because my daughter danced. And you have to have a background in community service because my daughter did. Um, The second bucket is kids who want to major in dance, but they need to have a background in community service. And then the third bucket, which is not um, a place where you typically see scholarships, is for kids with special needs. And that's why we call it the scholarship for kids with all abilities, who may not go to a traditional college, may go to some other form of post-high school education, but they, they can use some resources as well. So we've set up this scholarship program. My daughter will never get to go to college, but I hope that we'll be able to continue raising the funds to help send other kids to college on her behalf. Well, I love that. That's awesome. Um, and again, that is uh, orangeribbonsforjamie.org, I believe. Is that correct? correct. And Jamie awesome. is spelled J-A-I-M-E. Perfect. That's super helpful. And uh, the, again, the book is called Find the Helpers, and we'll put up uh, in the show notes links to both of those things and where you can find the book. It's out now. We're 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 just about uh, out of time here, and I, and I know you've you've got to run. We have a last few questions we ask everybody, Fred. Uh, the first one seems a little ridiculous in the context of our conversation. Usually, it's a little more a- ambiguous for our scientists and such. I'll ask it anyways. When was the first time in your life when you realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful? Wow. Um, You know, I've always lived a pretty kind of small circle. My life is always focused on my work, my family, my business. Um, But I've always known my voice could resonate. Um, There are those who knew me up until February 14th, 2018, who would have told you I'm a relentless pain in the ass. Um, and, and that quality has existed in me since I'm a kid. Um, and I think I'm using that quality now to do what I'm doing. Um, you know, so I, I don't know that I have a great answer to that question, um, but it sure started after February 14th. Yeah. But, um. Fred, who is someone in your life that's positively impacted your work in the past six months? Without question, our next president, Joe Biden. Could you talk for just a minute about that? Yeah, yeah I mean, obviously, he is, you've lived different lives, but he is someone who has endured just. He is so a much. man who has endured horrible grief, who took the time to reach out to me and to spend a whole lot of time, not just a couple of minutes on multiple occasions, talking about grief and helping me to get through what I've gone through, helping me to understand what it's going to look like, talking to me about mission and purpose. Um, What you see with him, this decent, civil, empathetic person, that is who he is. Well, I'm so glad that he has been in your life, then hopefully he can be 
a leader for us with, again, so many people going through so much uh, to have someone who who has spent their entire life, frankly, going through these things uh, is something that cannot be faked, clearly. Um, uh, Fred, uh, what is your self-care uh, <laughs> these days? When, when, you're, when you're feeling overwhelmed, which I can't even imagine what that means for you, but uh, what is your what is your distraction? We hear everything from ice cream to exercise to you know. I'm a car nut. Going for a walk in the woods. I'm a car nut. I have a convertible. I get out my convertible. I turn on Billy Joel, and the rest of the world disappears. <laughs> that sounds pretty damn good. Last one. Anything uh, else you would like to say to to speak truth to power to 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 get those last folks out there to to do the right thing? Failure to vote is not an option. Not in this election. This is not like the other elections. Your failure to vote could mean the country that you love will look very different after November 3rd. Your life, this democracy, depends upon your vote. Show up. I love it. Um, Fred, where can our listeners follow you online? Um, So they can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Um, I have my personal pages. I have my public page. The podcast that I've started is actually going to stream uh, on my Facebook uh, page, the public page. So okay. you can find me there. I have a website, fredguttenberg.com, um, where everything will be as well. And um, I hope people do follow. We're all in this together. I love it. Um, Fred, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how to express thank you for for something you shouldn't have to do, but but we are all so thankful that... You are you are taking the lead on and uh, and um, and 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 for everything you're all the ways you're you're helping to to change this country out of out of necessity and out of grief and and purpose. Um, so I urge you to keep kicking ass out there and, and anything we can do to help now or in the future. Please always let us know. You got it, guys. Listen, thank you, and um, you take care. Vote. Thanks to our incredible guest today, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at important, not imp. <sighs> Just it's so weird. Also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us, you know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. (laughs) And you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jam and music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks.